In the vast dominion of seven cities in the holy desert Raraku, the seer Shaikh and her followers prepare for the long prophesied uprising known as the Whirlwind. Unprecedented in size and savagery, this maelstrom of fanaticism and bloodlust will embroil the Malazan Empire in one of the bloodiest conflicts it has ever known, shaping destinies and giving birth to legends. Set in a brilliantly realized world ravaged by dark, uncontrollable magic, this thrilling novel of war, intrigue, and betrayal confirms Steven Erickson as a storyteller. We don't have to include that part. Hi, Alan Walker here, and welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. I had to let Samson go because, I mean, really, he'd just be laying there and his head would be out of frame, so you wouldn't be, really be able to see him the whole time anyway. But today, I will be reviewing Dead House Gates by Steven Erickson, the second book in the Malazan Book of the Fallen series. If you're here to find out whether or not you should read it, um, yes, you should. I find Dead House Gates to be overall a better book just in really every way than Gardens of the Moon, the first book. In fact, this last time I set about trying to finish the Malazan series, I didn't even start with Garden of the Moon. I had read it several times already, and so I just started with Dead House Gates. Gardens of the Moon doesn't really have a ton of effect on anything that comes afterwards that I've read so far. Yeah, it's got some ties into Memories of Ice and some things into Dead House Gates, but not really. Dead House Gates does a better job of making the world feel real, making things seem like what they're doing matters. Uh, the plot is much tighter. The threads are leading to a much more coherent conclusion. Uh, the characters, I think, are more likable. Really, all in all, with a couple exceptions, I think Dead House Gates is just a better book all around. Uh, there's just more... There's more weight to what's happening. There's more forward momentum. It's just more gripping, I think. Gardens of the Moon is just it has such a small plot with the Darugistanis and their Count of Monte Cristo plot, and then the taking of the streets of Darugistan, and then Lorne and Tool out in the hills searching for the Jagged Tyrant. And so all of that just seems really small, even though you know there's a large plot of Bruin. Uh, elsewhere. And so De Dead House Gates really does a better job of defining that. It lets you feel like there's a global threat rather than just this really localized one. So first I'm going to talk about the plot and I will leave this, I will make this as spoiler free as it's possible to talk about. And it is about Shaikh and the whirlwind, but that's not, it's not really even the most interesting plot in the book. And it all, that's really kind of a backdrop. That's not what this book is about. I wouldn't say that this book is about Shaikh and the Whirlwind if someone was to ask me. Now that is that is there, so you know what you know that there is the backdrop of Seven Cities, which is the desert subcontinent. We're off of Genabacus, where Gardens of the Moon took place. So it had previously been conquered by the Malazans under Emperor Kalanved and using the using the Talana Mas, but now uh, Kalanved's gone, and so these desert tribes and peoples are in rebellion, and they're kind of uniting under this great Cirrus Shaikh, who is supposed to summon this massive whirlwind of sand, which is the literal whirlwind out of the holy desert of Iraku, but the whirlwind is also more figuratively, the rebellion against the Malazans as they try to push the Malazans off of set of seven cities for good and for all. Just like in Gardens of the Moon, there are about five plot threads that are running that all end up kind of converging. A couple of them don't, but there's really just like two main convergences here at the end. Um, the main one is that the back of the book talks about is Shaikh and the rebellion. So we see Shaikh, this desert prophetess, and she has her two, her two bodyguards, Leomon of the Flails and Tobla Kai, who are pretty interesting characters. And you just see, you see that these rebels are forming. There's been mass uh, insurrection all across seven cities, the holy cities that were once under that were once under holy Falad control, but now they're under Malazan control. But now they've been torn apart by rebellion. Malazans are being put to the sword. It actually reminds me a lot of Mithridates the sixth, the king of uh, Pontus. During the time of Julius Caesar, he staged a rebellion against the Romans and had every Roman in the city killed, which wasn't really proper rules of war. And that's what's happening here. The seven cities are rising and they're murdering all the Malazans, whether they're civilian or tradesmen or whatever. Everyone's dying and being put to the sword, regardless of 
of whether they're affiliated with the military at all. Um, trying to keep the peace are the guards of these cities that are easily overrun. The main city that the Malazans still hold is Aaron. It's the most fortified, and the Aaron Guard is there, and it was the site of one of Kellenved's uh, massive victories or treasonous things that he's known for. And also we have the Red Blades, who are Seven Cities natives, who are diehard Malazan patriots. So they're turncoats to their countrymen, if you will. So that's really the backdrop. And, and so we see, we see Shaikh and her bodyguards trying to foment this rebellion. Now the other plots going on include, we see Ikarium, who we heard about in the first book. He's this, he's this ageless jagged that builds timepieces all over the world and has forever. We heard about him in Gardens of the Moon. So he's traveling with his Trell friend, and a Trell is just a giant. It's one of the many races of giants that Malazan has, and it, they're, they're plains dwellers. Anyway, his Trell friend's name is Mappo, and they're traveling seven cities together. <sighs> what a drag, man. Like, it's just a drag. They are a drag. Their storyline doesn't go anywhere. They're boring. And they're boring because Ericsson has to keep us in the dark. Mappo knows what Ikarium has done, but he won't tell us even though we're in his head. He just refers to the, oh, vaguely, Ikarium's rage and what he, just tell us what he did and make it interesting. And because Ikarium doesn't know anything, he's just this guy that wanders around and looks at old stuff. And he doesn't even comment on how cool it is. He's just like, huh, I must have been here before. And Mappo's like, friend, no. And Ikarium's like, Ugh, have I been here? Ugh. What? Ugh. Boring. Just boring. They're just boring. They're just boring. Boring. The most boring parts of the book, really. So next we have a plot that isn't really hinted about in the first book, but it's in Unta, the capital of the Malazan Empire, there's a purge of the nobles. Lacine ugh, is purging the noble families, despite the fact that, well, I guess she thinks Gano's Paran is dead. Whatever. Lacine is doing a noble family purge, getting rid of the old noble families that I guess could be inimical towards her. And so we see Felis and Paran, the youngest sister of Gano's from Gardens of the Moon, she's on this chain gang, and she's attached to, on one side, this priest named Heberic, who is a priest of Fenner, the, the boar of summer, one of the several gods of war that the Malazan world has. And on the other end, this just big rogue dude named Bodden, who in the very opening scene in the prologue, twists some old lady's head off because that's who he is. That tells you everything you need to know about his character. Oh, my phone went off. In the prologue, Felicen and Heberic and Bodden are shipped to the Otaral Isle, where, where the Empire mines its Otaral. You'll remember that is the, the ore or the dust that prevents magic use. And so they're in the mines, and then what happens there and what happens afterwards. We see Felicen and Bodden and Heberic, who was once a scholar, but Lacine apparently didn't like what he was writing about, so she cut off his hands and sent him there. And they end up on their own journey. And it is interesting, but what makes it one of my least faves is the characters, man. Felicen, Heberic, and Bodden. If you liked the time you spent with them, please say so in the comments, because I did not enjoy it all that much, man. I just did not. Then we've got Fiddler. Fiddler is, as you know from Gardens of the Moon, one of the bridge burners, and he has come to Seven Cities, which is where Callum is from, and Callum, Callum is on, is trying to go on a journey to assassinate the Empress. Good. And Fiddler is with him, helping him out, and he's got Crocus and Absalar, and they're looking for Absalar's, remember Absalar was sorry from the first book, um, they're looking for Absalar's dad, and they're gonna, you know, Crocus is in love with her, and they want to send her home with her dad. And that's really why Fiddler and and Crocus and Absalar are there. Uh, Callum has a, a different mission. Fiddler constantly remembers the last time he and the Bridge Burners were in Seven Cities. Fiddler and Callum and Absalar and Crocus, they all end up, their storyline kind of ties more in with the shapeshifters that we, that we really see for the first time. There's a ton of shapeshifters in this book. Um, and the shapeshifter concept 
is actually one of the things I really like about the Malazan world. Um, you have the Soul Taken, who are people that can turn into singular animals or dragons or something else. They can shape change into something larger and more terrifying and more powerful. Like we have Mesrim, who turns into this huge grizzly bear. We see in their opening chapter, they're on uh, the ocean on a ship and they see the Dinrabi, which I guess are these giant worm sharks. I picture them as like Remorhazes from D&D. If you know what that is, like a cross between a remor has and a, and a shark or a purple worm, something like that. Uh, we see one of those in their very first chapter, in chapter one. But then you have the divers, which if you don't know what the word divers means, divers means a bunch. Um, that was a word that I actually did not know until I read Dead House Gates. Like if you have divers of, like divers something, you have a ton of something. So the divers are people that can turn into multiple animals or multiple creatures. One of the most terrifying is Grillin, who can turn into a horde of rats. And it is just absolutely horrifying to see Grillin. Steven Erickson writes some good horror scenes and Grillin is terrifying. So when you read it, Grillin, a horde of rats, guys! A horde of rats! So that's really interesting, and Fiddler and Callum and Sorry, sorry, Absalar and Crocus interact with that all leading toward the conclusion. And then finally, which if you've read Dead House Gates, you know that this is the real story, which is the chain of dogs. So I mentioned the insurrection. The insurrection has hit all the way up uh, in Hisar, which is this northern holy city. And so Coltane, who is a fist, which is like general in the Malazan army, he is charged in taking the refugees of Hisar all the way down to Aaron, which, as I said, is the most protected city. And so he's transporting some 50,000 refugees over 1,500 miles on foot. Now, Coltane is a, he is a Wiccan, W-I-C-K-A-N, not W-I-C-C-A-N. And the Wiccans are really kind of analogous to um, the Native Americans. And they were conquered, their homelands are in Quantali, which is the main uh, Malazan continent. Um, and they were conquered by the Malazans and have kind of been subsumed into the Malazan army. And Coltane is in charge of one of the armies. And the chain of dogs, it's told from the perspective of Duiker, who is an imperial historian, who is in the city looking for, he's looking for Heberic, and so all these kind of threads tie in. And he ends up having to escape with Coltane and all of these refugees. And guys, the journey of Coltane from Hisar to Aaron, and the things that happen along the way, and just the way it is written, and the desperation, guys, this is some good writing. And any of you who have read it, who were waiting for me to talk about The Chain of Dogs, you all know The Chain of Dogs, and we all know what I'm talking about right now. Go read the book, oh my goodness, read the book, and then come back to me after you've read The Chain of Dogs. Um, that really is the most gripping part of the book to me. It's just urgent and it's desperate. While the other storylines story kind of plod along like Erickson does, he, you know, slow and steady, getting to the point. The chain of dogs is just like, we gotta go. And there's the rebel armies that are surrounding him. Man, it is good stuff. And the conclusion of the chain of dogs storyline is one of the best stuff in all of the Malazan books. Again, I am at Toll the Hounds. So I, if it was in book eight, nine, or 10, I can't judge on that. But for the first eight books, including two Esselmont books, The Chain of Dogs remains one of my favorite storylines. So with the plot out of the way, let me talk about the other aspects of the book. Erickson's writing style is, it can be irritating and sometimes as you're acclimating to it, once you've acclimated, read a bunch of Erickson books, it tends to go faster. I remember the first time I read Gardens of the Moon and Dead House Gates, it just, it just took me forever. Uh, but as I read more and more, I'm just used to how he writes. I know exactly the parts I can kind of like speed read a little faster and the parts I need to kind of hone in on. Uh, that just comes with, with time for any author, really. His prose, it doesn't do a super great job of really grounding you. Erickson's prose tends to be really, really dense when you don't want it to be and really, really sparse when you don't want it to be. There's a lot, as I complained about in Gardens on the Moon, there's still a lot of like 
stuff that the characters know that since we're following their viewpoint, we should also know. So that just always gets irritating. There is slightly less of the people addressing each other by their title or race in this one than in Gardens of the Moon. I at least didn't notice it quite as bad. There's not a lot of, hey, assassin, hey, mage. Well, I take that back. They call Duiker historian all the time. Slightly better because that's his job. It's not really his classification. Like you would call your, you would call the general general. That's fine. And he is the historian, but it still gets annoying to hear all the time. Like historian, 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 come with us. Historian, just call him Duiker. That's his name, call him Duiker. But what Erickson does do a good job is describing ruins, man. You can definitely, again, tell that he is an archeologist, anthropologist, sociologist, because he has really distinct cultures, really distinct differences in the races and uh, the different areas of the world. Lots of description about ruins, lots of desert and lots of ruins. So be prepared when you read this, you're gonna hear a lot about deserts and a lot about ruins. Um, but he, he just does a masterful job really describing that stuff. The characters are good. I liked the characters overall, just the interaction between the characters. I don't like a lot of the characters better, but I like the interaction and the interplay between the characters better. I think he does a better job in this book of defining characters. I think the characters are much more obviously uh, differentiated. And that's probably because it's not just the Malazans this time. So it's not everyone isn't a gruff soldier. Now everyone is just kind of grumpy. And this is why I like Fiddler because at least he has a sense of humor. But everyone is either just distraught or grouchy all the time. But it's not just one grizzled soldier to another grizzled soldier. And that's a challenge for anybody. As usual for Erickson, the dialogue is, is pretty easy to read if sometime kind of stilted. Erickson does this thing where you, you can tell he played D&D, &D, and he did. The, the Amalazan books are based on him and Esselmont's D&D &D game, and that's totally fine. But when you play D&D &D a lot, and you've read D&D &D books, and you've played JRPGs, you're, especially when you're trying to make bad guys sound cool, you know, the really calm, collected bad guy is supposed to drop one-liners, and like, you know, the, the gentleman's bad guy. They just, it's, sometimes they don't land and it sounds lame. And so some of the dialogues really is, is hokey, but the conversations between the soldiers are actually really good. It, it, it just sounds like they're guys in trouble. It sounds like they're everyday guys. It, he does a really good job in the early books, especially of not making uneducated people sound educated. Now in his later books where everyone's a philosopher, it gets kind of worse. I like in Dead House Gates that we know there's an entire other section of the Malazan army, an entire other plot going on uh, across the sea in Genabacus while we're here in a completely different continent. So I like that he brings in another continent, which really just kind of expands uh, the world building. I, I almost like that we know more about the foreign lands of the Malazan Empire, like Genabacus and Seven Cities, than we do about Quantali or Unta or Malaz City. They don't really go into like the home base of the Malazan Empire until much later. So on the King Fen approval system, from Horrible Minus all the way up to Superb Plus, I actually give Dead House Gates a Superb Minus. It definitely belongs up there in the top tier. I would give it five stars, four and a half at the least, 4.75, because it is one of the better Malazan books, in my opinion. There are a lot fewer threads that go nowhere, like we see in the later Malazan books. People don't philosophize every two seconds, like we see in the later Malazan books. Some of these plots, man, so cool and action everywhere. So superb minus, really, really good book. Definitely recommend getting it. All right, the rest of the review is gonna be spoilers as I talk about some things I thought were really awesome in the book and some things that I just didn't like and oh my gosh. If you're gonna keep going, be warned that there's major spoilers, spoiling the whole book. So boom, spoilers up there now, gonna throw up the spoiler graphic. All right, if you are still here, I'm going to talk about spoilers. Boom, let's talk about the chain of dogs, guys. Are you kidding me? Like everyone I know that has read the chain of dogs, this is one of the most emotional like times you've had in a book. Coltane and the refugees make it 1,500 miles only to be screwed over at the very end by the Oh, Jack Weasel, Malik Rell, and stupid High Fist Pormquall, or Pomquarrel, or whatever his dumb name is, 
and oh my gosh, how, d if you were not screaming, you, you missed it. You didn't read the book. I, I don't understand how you can read the end of the chain of dogs and not just throw, want to throw the book. Oh my goodness gracious. Just really one of the most heart-wrenching things I've ever read in, in a book, really ever. And that's really what I liked the most. I hated the Felicen heberic bodden storyline because Felicen is insufferable, guys. Like, I think it's awesome that she's Shaikh reborn. That's awesome. Um, I'm not gonna talk in spoilers because I've read past this one, but if you haven't, Shaik Reborn, that's a cool idea. I like that she's with Liam and Toblakai, but she is ju just shut up and quit whining, Felicen. Shut up. And her, I mean, I understand that Tavor put you in this. My problem, a lot of my problem with Erickson is these people are supposed to be making these elaborate plans and they're just bad plans. What Tavor did doesn't make any sense. Like, it's just a terrible idea to start with. Tavor putting her in the Atutteral Mines to then rescue her, that is just so boneheaded. The Callum storyline where he doesn't assassinate Lacine and that Lacine, this bothers me in any book it's discussed about. The fact that, oh, Lacine doesn't really hate the bridge burners and Dujek's army, that she had to kill the bridge burners because it had to look like she was turning against them. And it had to look like he was going, he was rebelling and mutinying and ugh, get out of here. Like this is, if you read, if you listen to my top 10 on why Lacine is on my top 10 worst characters in the Malazan Empire, it's cause of crap like this. No one buys it, Lacine. It's a stupid idea, and everyone seems to know it's staged. So what was the point? What's the point, Lacine? Dumb. Let's also talk about the worst kept secret of all time, that Shadow Throne and Cotillion are Kellenved and Dancer. One, not a huge surprise. Two, everyone seems to be able to figure that out through random clues like, hmm, Oh, I see that there's some scuffed dirt here, and also a dog print. Could it mean Kellenved and Dancer have ascended? What? That's cool. I mean, we saw it coming, and that's fine. I'm glad that Shadow Throne and Cotillion are Kellenved and Dancer. I love that. But to act like it's this big secret, like no one knew, I don't really understand that. And the way the people are figuring it out, people who aren't, you know, big brains, I don't really understand it. Everyone and their mom seems to, know, seems to know that as well. Like I said before, if you want to talk about anything that I've said, if you disagree with me, you want to add to it, I would love to have a dialogue about Dead House Gates in the comment. So please comment and we will talk about Dead House Gates up, down, through, and sideways. Thanks for watching.